10, it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room for it. So with that, if you're able to stand, stand with us, and we're going to sing, Open up the heavens, and we're ready to receive from the Lord. together and you're helping us uh, to help Pastor Benny while he's on the rock visiting his family and while we can't be in Newfoundland with him we can still stand on the rock our Lord and in Psalms 18 and 2 it says the Lord is my rock my fortress my deliverer my God is my rock in whom I take refuge my shield he is our rock Oh. 
that the Bible records all the promises to every believer. And one promise is in Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So he's here. He's here, so open your heart as we sing Waymaker. sing this morning. We're singing scripture. All of our songs come from scripture and that builds our faith and our trust. And our next song is based on Isaiah 43 verse 1. The Lord who created you says, do not be afraid. I will save you. I have called you mine. You are mine. I've called you by name. You are mine. Bye. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. God is good. It's so beautiful to see everybody here today. And um, I believe that we all enjoyed the worship. Did you feel the spirit of God right there? Would you give the Lord a big hand? God is good. Amen. <laughs> um, so, uh, I first of all want to thank God for this opportunity to be sharing the Word of God with you today. Um, I want to thank the leadership of the church, Pastor Ben. He's my guy. He's uh, he's one of the main reasons that I joined this church. We just, I think there was that Sunday morning, myself and my sibling and his family and my mom we we had visited different churches and i was like you know what i'm not going to any other church today i want to try another church and so we went on google map and looked for the nearest church and we found ilim ilim okay all right and then we drove here and by the time we got here of course it was pastor that uh, pastor ben that was talking and i was like hmm i like this guy and you know the message was really powerful and we had a great time and of course the church was really welcoming everybody my mom got her best friend that day i, I don't remember who but uh so you know you know how you welcome people so beautiful it's so welcoming i'm like um i don't see any other black person here but um i'm gonna stay <laughs> you know and it's been lovely since then praise god and you know it was also beautiful because i think before i joined the church there was that time when um i was doing a musical uh, shrek the musical ali was there owen was there and i used to see this guy owen you know he looked, he still was growing his hair back then and he looked like jesus you know he looked like a slim jesus and i used to wonder who is this gentle guy you know who looked like jesus and of course, I came to church, saw him. I was like, oh, Jesus attends Elim. <laughs> so if you're looking for the manger, you can be sure it's in Pastor Ben's house. You know, because the slim Jesus was born there. Praise God. Yeah, um, well, thank you, Pastor Ed. Um, I appreciate you, know, you coordinating the service. And today I'm just going to be sharing uh, from the Word of God. And I want to believe that today God is going to touch each and every one of us, you know, um, and hopefully, you know, inspire our hearts to uh, revival and to, you know, see a different, in a different light what has been going on, especially in our community and how it is important for us as Christians to rise up. Last week, Pastor Ben started on the message which he titled... Um, taking our position in the spiritual realm. And of course, he went on to talk about fasting and prayers. Uh, when Pastor Ben was done last week, 
you know, just right here on the stage, I remember whispering to him that, Pastor, you just preached my message. Because he had told me about, about you know, uh, at some point I was going to be sharing, but I think we hadn't picked the date, so I'd been trusting God for a word, and it, it was centered around the book of Esther. And so, of course, to my ultimate surprise, Pastor Ben preached the message. I was like, oh, well, it's good and not so. Because, you know, if you preach your message, that means you heard from God. If the pastor is preaching exactly what God has put on your heart, right? So, um, and I was hoping, okay, well, he wouldn't close with that bit that I had in mind. You know, the, uh, Esther chapter 4, verse 16, where Esther was talking to other people, I mean, to Mordecai, saying, you know, you guys go fast and pray, and I'm going to meet the king, and if I perish, I perish. And then, of course, that was one of his, his closing statements. I was like, okay, so he didn't leave anything for me now. <laughs> Praise God. But before we go into that, I'd like us to pray. Father, today we acknowledge your grace and mercy. We thank you for this awesome time in your presence we thank you because we know that your presence is here because your word says that where we are gathered where two or three are gathered in your name there you are with us and so god we know that you are here with us and your word also makes us to understand that you dwell in the praises of your people and as we praise you with our songs and our lives we know that you are here and so god as we share your word today we pray that you will speak to our hearts you will revive our hearts our lives our souls you help us to get that fire of the holy spirit to become more uh, of useful instruments for you especially in our community in jesus name amen praise god so esther chapter 4 verse 16 you know there was something about that scripture you know of course we already heard the story and esther was like you know what I am going to meet the king, and if I perish, I perish. There was something very profound about that. And, you know, I'm thinking, this is a young lady who had just become queen, maybe a year or, I mean, he still, she still didn't have kids, so we want to assume he's still in the first year of, uh, very early in the marriage, and maybe hasn't even seen the king too many times because she had to be summoned in order to meet the king. But... She thought, you know what, something dire is going to happen. My people, is going, my people are going to be killed. And I think it's, worth, it's not worth that I'm alive and everybody else dies. So it's better that I am dead even if everybody else is going to die. But I'm going to take that chance to make sure that I do all that I can, given the opportunities that I have, using the power and the capability that I have to meet the king, and if I perish, I perish. At that point, she wasn't thinking about herself. And, you know, that makes me think about, um, imagine a conversation between God and Jesus, where um, I imagine when, Jesus, when God was going to send Jesus to the earth to die for me, you know, God was like, okay, um, Jesus, uh, okay, I imagine maybe Jesus playing video games, you know, somewhere in the house. And then he's just right there. So, uh, Jesus, yes, Dad. Um, you know what, there's something I need you to do. What's that, Dad? Um, you know Steve? Oh, Steve the angel? Oh, no, Steve the angel is good. Um, oh, are you talking about Steve the Nigerian guy? Oh, yeah, Steve the Nigerian guy. Yeah, oh, wow. He's the darkest creation you've ever made, God. That guy is so dark, he stains his own white. <laughs> and, you know, he's just bantering with, Jesus, with God, his father there. And God says, you know what? I need you to... Steve has made a deal with someone. And it looks like he's not going to be able to make that payment. I need you to go make that payment for him. I was like, um, okay, well, that's fine. I can always go make the payment for him. But... What's the payment? I say, well, Steve would have to die. It's like, what? You mean he has to? Well, I mean, he deserves it. Do you realize that Steve, Steve is a serial killer. 
he has people under his basement. <laughs> That's good shit. But anyway, uh, do you know that Steve is a serial killer? Do you know that Steve is a, a murderer? Do you know that Steve, I mean, Steve couldn't, can't even get married because, I mean, who would marry that kind of guy, you know? And he's, he's just mentioning some of the things that Steve does. By the way, Steve is representative of the world, okay? Just in case. Yeah. And says, oh, Steve does this, he lies, he backbites, he, um, he's committed uh, adultery, he fornicates, he's uh, whatever, he's, he's, he smoked all the crack in the world that crack doesn't even sell anymore, you know, and oh, Steve is, le is a lesbian, Steve is transgender, Steve is uh, gay, Steve is all of those things, and you really want me to go die for that guy? I mean, if he dies, that's, I mean, he had it coming. And Jesus said, oh, and God said, okay, you know what? I know he's worth, I mean, he's, he should die, but I love him more than that. And Jesus was like, well, why should I have to die? And God goes like, you know, I think I actually love him more than your life. And so at some point, Jesus says, okay, um, if you can let this cup pass over, that's fine, but not my will, but yours. And then he came to the earth. He died for Steve. And Steve has been redeemed. And he's been transformed. And Steve is, one of the Steves is standing right in front of you. Now, it is like, I mean, that's just my imagination, but we know how the story of, the salva of salvation played out. But it was, I was so important to Jesus, I mean to God, that God would say, you know what? I cannot afford that Steve would die. I can't afford that. Steve has to remain alive. He has to keep living. And Jesus came to die. And here we are. Praise God. Now, when we take a look at that, the two stories, Esther and Jesus, if I perish, I perish. It wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. I believe that God has given us the power from the day that we got born again. God has given us the enablement, the power to establish his kingdom here on earth. And, you know, when we read through the Bible in Matthew chapter 6, it talks about the Lord's Prayer. It says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us all our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not and deliver us from evil. Did I miss any line? Okay. Yeah, you know the scripture. Now, it goes on to talk about that, but one of the first things that, the script, that Jesus helped us to understand is it is quite important for us to adore God, but it is also very important for us to understand that his kingdom is more important than anything else. In Matthew 6, 33, it goes on to say that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And then when you go into Romans chapter 14, verse 17, I think, it says, now the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost, righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That means the moment we, we gave our lives to Christ, we became Christians, the order of our days was not for just living life. It is to establish the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. So for everywhere that you are, for every domain that God gives you, God is not going to look at the domain to say, oh, why is everybody, you know, why is that place in chaos? What is going on? Why is everybody sinful? God is just going to take a look at that domain and say, I think Steve is there. What is Steve doing? Why is Steve not doing anything about this place? And, you know, this became a burden upon my heart, you know, about a year and a half ago. 
And I started thinking, what, what could change? Why in Sault Ste. Marie, for example, churches are closing down, they're turning into hostels or accommodations. In fact, the truth is, if there's a church shutting down right now and it's up for sale, I'm probably going to want to buy one. Why? Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, I hope I got that right, where it talks about the fact that we are a city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. And then later in the verses, goes ahead to talk about the fact that we're the salt and light of the world. And Jesus goes on to talk about the fact that when the salt loses its taste, it is not worth more than to be trampled up, you know, upon, underfoot by men. And so what is the purpose of the church in Sault Ste. Marie if taking a look, I've visited a number of churches and taking, and of course, some of my friends have also, and you look at the population. The larger population are the older generation, which means when the old generation, the older generation is passed on or moved on, who is going to be left in church? This reminds me a story of um, growing up in Nigeria. Um, so usually you would, you, you could or you would uh, rear chickens in your backyard. And uh, you read them for either the, you broiled them or for their eggs. And you, of course, you know the eggs to make the cheeks and all of that. But what usually would happen is, if we wanted to take a meal, maybe have some scrambled eggs, omelette, as you call them here, although I don't think that's what we call them in Nigeria, you would have to chase the chicken, you, you check when the chicken lays the eggs. And then you would, maybe sometime, it depends on what your style is. If you're very bold, you wait it until later in the day, but oftentimes it's easier when it's darker in the day, like 5 a.m., 6 a.m., so the chickens can't really see. So what you did was we went there, you chased the chicken, and then you start distracting the chicken. Meanwhile, somebody else goes ahead to pick the eggs or the number of eggs that you want. And so the chicken gets back eventually to you know, where it laid all the eggs, and maybe 10 is now six or four or three, and she has to you know, just make do with what's left. Now, when you look at that story, the future has just been taken away from that chicken, right? She's going to have to wait till another cycle to lay eggs, and hopefully nobody steals that, those eggs. Now, when you read the scripture in, um, I think it's Genesis chapter three, where you know, God was talking, God was giving, laying out the punishments to Adam, Eve, and the serpent. Um, God did say something to the serpent that he's going to put an enmity between the seed of the woman and him. Of course, it says that the, uh, the seed of the woman is going to crush his head, he will bruise the heel and all of that. But there's something a little bit kind of instructional there or instructive there where why is the serpent not going to attack the woman? It leaves the woman and goes for the next generation. And that seems to be like the order of the day when you look at a community like this. Just uh, about a week ago, I was talking with an 18-year-old boy, and we're just having this chat. And then he just told me that, um, that it's about a year and a half since he stopped doing crack or drugs. I was like, 18? If you take away a year and a half from 18, that's like 16 and a half. And we all know that for anybody to con consider himself addictive, it doesn't happen overnight. So he's probably had some like two, three years before then. That means he started it pretty young, right? Now, that is one guy who could have been saved and baptized and transformed, and he's using his life more effectively than what he has right now. In fact, his eyes were just all over the place. He couldn't keep focus. And I'm like, 18? 
And these are the next generations. If you look at the church, very few youths, um, the, or the youths that are there are hardly even committed to anything. That means there's a problem right now. And so if we, as ambassadors of Christ, are supposed to step in a place and establish his righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost, do you know how much power we have? The Bible says in Acts 1.8, he says, um, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be uh, my witnesses um, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all to the uttermost part of the earth, you know, you shall receive that power. Now, what is that power? It's the same power that we understand from scriptures, which the Bible says that is, and this same spirit, which raised Christ from the dead, shall quicken your mortal body. So this same power, you know, the Bible also says that, the, uh, that he has given us power to trample upon snakes and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, I think that's Luke 10, 19 and nothing shall by any means hurt us. That means, you know what, we are superhuman beings doing next to nothing as Christians here on earth. Why? Because we are ambassadors. This is not even our domain. We are not even just ordinary human beings. And so if we are not doing anything, what happens to the salt trampled upon by men? Did you notice how easy it was to shut down the church when there was COVID? Just by one instruction. Yeah, of course, it's health. But where I'm going with that is, there may come a time, if we do not rescue the current generation that is growing, there may come a time when they will get into power and with just one instruction, churches will not exist again. Very likely. Did you notice that it's possible, it's easier to do a pride fest out there in the open than hold a placard and say Jesus is Lord right now? So if we who have all the answers, we keep saying that Jesus is the answer and we are hardly as proud as those who profess pride. Does that make sense? Amen? Are we together here today? Am I making sense? Yes. Great. So, if we have the power, it's just like, it's just like being given sledgehammers. We all have a sledgehammer. I'll keep dragging it around. You know the power, you know what the sledgehammer can do. It can take down the wall. But all we're doing with it is crack eggs. Because we don't know how much power we carry. Do you know that this same power, the Bible says that this signs shall follow them that believe. I think that's Mark 16, 15. Um, this signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, they shall, uh, what's that other one? They shall speak in other tongues. They shall drink deadly poison, nothing shall hurt them. Right? Doesn't that sound like superpower? In us, the same spirit that Jesus walked with on earth. The Bible says that Jesus went around doing good, healing all of them that were oppressed of the devil. Now, sometimes I wonder where that power is when somebody tells me that they're depressed. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. There is no way you would have the joy of the Spirit and feel a depression. You might feel sad for a short time, but the joy of the Holy Ghost, depression cannot hold there. What then is the difference between us and, uh, us and those who do not believe if the same things that they suffer are the same things that we suffer? What is the difference? Have we ever considered that maybe, just maybe, it might be that we are not doing enough to... Um, and to further the kingdom of God. And so we still are distracted while the enemy is taking our eggs. Get a job. Get a girlfriend. My child is something. My wife is something. 
my husband, or I hate my boss, and the enemy keeps stealing our eggs as we keep being distracted. Maybe, just maybe. When we take a look at Susan Mary, for example, um, there's some certain issues like um, there's the opioid <clears throat> crisis. There was uh, that news that showed that uh, they wanted to raise a monument for those who were victims of the you know, overdose. I'm thinking, wow, why are people overdosing? And God is looking down in Susan Mary saying, wow, why are those kids overdosing? I thought I put Steve there. Why is everybody dying? Why are people depressed? You know, the power that we receive here in church is not for church. It is for us to be effective in the outside world. And I can, I can, I can give an example. There was that one time I was teaching a class I, uh, at Sioux College, and we had, that was before the lockdown, we had that short break, so I take some five minutes breaks. And I was like, oh, you know, I could come up with a topic and students would just chat about it. And I remember seeing this lady, she's not, she's, she's not a Christian, I, I don't know if she is now, because she graduated, so we've not been in touch. I saw her, as, as I looked at her, I thought I saw the image of an elderly woman who was ill, and I just, I asked her, I said, how are you doing? She said, fine. I said, how's your mom? I hope she's okay. And then you could see how her face just flushed. And she started talking right there in class. She was saying, oh, well, she's been ill for this number, of, uh, for this many months. We are hoping nothing goes wrong with her. Now, I believe that, you know, it was a, uh, a gift of the spirit that was working on the inside of me that day. And I was like, well, um, I'm going to say a prayer for you. Of course, I didn't pray with her in class because, you know, the law protects everything. So, <laughs> so I prayed for her. And I think, uh, I think in about a week or by the next class, she came, she was like, oh, my mom is doing very well. Of course, she got an A in that class because now she felt like there was a professor who actually cared about her mom. And I'm thinking... What if that was the way we were, we are, in the places where we work? We're not complaining about our bosses just like everybody else. When we see the kids, you know, doing all these stupid things they do, we don't, we don't join everybody to say, oh, youthful exuberance. Do you know that now it's easier for fathers to give their sons condoms than to give them the word of God? Christian fathers. I know you know that. Are we establishing this righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost? Now, I also work in the city hall. And so by privilege of that role, I, I get to listen in on a lot of the things that are going on. I'm like, God, you have to save this city. And if we as Christians, you know, this, this just means the chicken thing. <laughs> We're being distracted. We're never going to be able to achieve anything. It us to, first of all, rise up and pray. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land, their land, that territory that God has given them. If my people, if we think about that scripture very well, if my own people who are called by my name will humble themselves, that means right now they're not humble, and pray, which means right now they're not praying, and turn from their wicked ways. They're still named by the name of God, but they're still proud, they don't pray, and they're still doing wrong things, but still called by the name of God. So let us not be mistaken that we are not God's children, but we could still be God's children doing the wrong things for supposedly the right reasons. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. And so people are watching us. 
We are people that other people are looking up to as that Jesus example. And if we fail in the delivery of the power, in delivering the righteousness, the peace, the joy of the Holy Ghost, what are they going to do? Shut it down. And they can. Probably will. So this is something that I want to believe that God wants us to rise up to in this time. The end time, we, we've read the Bible, the end time, things are going to be worse and worse. But we are not here for now. We are here for then. This is not our dwelling place. This, the moment we gave our lives to Jesus, our future, our destination was secured. The reason Jesus or God didn't take us out of the earth was because he wants us to establish his kingdom. The Bible makes us to understand that we have been called unto as priests and kings unto God. That means as a king, we have domains. I think that's in 2 Peter. We, as a king, we have domain. As a priest, we have a responsibility. We have to pray for the city. We have to, you know, declare what we want to happen in this city because God has given this place to us as a possession. So if we don't do that, we will keep seeing the things that we're seeing. And how do I know? The results you see in a city tells you the spirit that is prevalent upon the city, the one that is most active. And so if it is not righteousness, peace, or joy in the Holy Ghost, then it must mean that it's the spirit of the devil that is controlling everything. And if the spirit of the devil is controlling everything, with Steve, with Josh, with Esther, with everybody that are here, that is here right now, just this number of people, if we took up the responsibility to say no, Susan Mary belongs to the Lord, we are not going to let it go. Yes, the kids are failing right now, but we call their spirit back to the kingdom of God. We, we, we dispossess the enemy of this territory. We take this place back until we rise up and pray. God is not going to heal this land. Because he's not going to do for us what we have not allowed him to do in our territories. He's the king of kings. He's given us jurisdiction over this, you know, this territory. So if we're here, it's high time we got back on our knees and pray and you know, seek the face of God and ensure that that kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost is established here. And it's not, play, it's not a joke. It's not, it's not something we should toy with because by the, at the end of the time, God is going to look at you and say, yeah, I put you in St. Marie for just about a year or three years or all your life. Tell me what you did. Did you just get a job, get married, grow old, die? Did you just do the barest minimum, attend church? The power we receive within the walls of church is for outside, the outside world. And if they can't feel that power, then we are not representing the authority we're supposed to. I think it's serious, right? If God looked down and say, Margaret, what did you do? Oh, my mom was difficult. Oh, she didn't treat me well, you know. Oh, yeah, but what did you do with the love that I put in your heart? What did you do on your knees when you prayed? Did you spend time complaining and asking for the things that I already know you need? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. For your father knows you need them. So ask for the things you need, but your primary assignment is establishing the kingdom. As I thought about this, I was... I was also hoping that, you know, maybe at the, at the end of uh, my encouragement or sermon, I'm not sure if that's what I'll call it, um, that we'll be able to spend some time to pray. Is that okay? 
that okay? Praise God. Praise God. So we do have an advantage. We are super men, super women. But I don't think we're doing well enough. The churches are getting empty by the day. People take going to church as just another chore. Oh, I'll go if I feel like. They don't see it as a place of power. What then is the benefit of the Holy Spirit? Why do we have him? The same spirit that raised Jesus, that you call Lord from the dead, the same spirit resides on the inside of you, heals your body. You know, tells you, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will be our counselor. He will be our guide. He will show us things to come. He will um, bring all things to our, uh, our memory, to our remembrance. So these things are there. But if all of those things, you know, things of the Holy Spirit are not active in our lives, then it must mean that we have the sledgehammers and we're only cracking eggs, doing the barest minimum. I want to believe that God is going to raise an army that is going to set this city free. And it will happen in our time, in this place, while we're alive and here to enjoy the fruits of the revival that will happen in this land. And I want to believe that, you know, as we go on ahead, so many things have to be done. One, we have to, first of all, you know, disabuse our minds about what those who come to church must look like. Because I can imagine that somebody who is not born again will probably look a certain way. Maybe he's just finished doing drugs. And for some reason, he steps into the walls of church. It's not the time to wonder why he's looking the way he's looking. Give him the power. Once he has the power, it's going to change. Why? Because I think in John, 1 John 3, 2, the Bible says that it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know we shall be like him when we see him as he is. Um, I think in 2 Corinthians, there's that point where he talked about but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, have been transformed into his likeness. So first of all, they have to show up in church. And we have to find a way to bring them in. So they can come with their multicolors of pride. They can come with their crack. They can come with whatever. They just need to be where they can meet the Lord. Because if we think they have to look perfect before they can step in, then we're already failing the simple test. We have to do something. We have to, we have to be able to overlook awkwardness because not a, until people are transformed, they're not going to be able to change. Until, I mean, they're not going to be able to look the way you think they should look. And who says they should look the way you think they should look? Once God looks at their heart, the Bible says that a contrite heart he will never cast away. So, if we're not going to be the judges of heart, then we need to make sure that we can get people into church. Praise God. Amen? We need to also um, start praying. We need to start praying particularly for the city. Raising the name of the city from the seat of the government to the edges of the city. We have to pray. It's not, a, it's not a casual thing because this is our business. This is our responsibility. This is something we are going to be accountable for. What did you do when you were in Sault Ste. Marie? We have to find other ways. I, I'm sure there are you know, different ways that we do hospital visits, maybe prison visits or correctional center visits. Collaborate with other churches in order to make sure that the kingdom of God is established here. Now, that is not something that happens every time. But if we all serve the same Lord, then we must stop the competition. We have to get to a point where we stop looking at who has the highest number of uh, attendance or whose budget is bigger. As long as the kingdom is established, God looks at you and says, four thumbs up. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Can we rise up to pray?
my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. I want us to raise our hands and our voices and ask for mercy, mercy upon this land. Father, have mercy on Sault Ste. Marie. This is the place in which you have put us. This is the place in which you, we are here to establish your kingdom. God, we know that there is the drug crisis. We know that a lot of people are not in church. People are delinquent. People are moving away from the gospel, partly because we have shacked away from our responsibilities. But God, we ask for your mercy upon this land. Father, we ask for your mercy upon this land. Save our city, God, in the name of Jesus. Save our city, God, in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that your spirit will begin to, to hover across the darkness over this city and let there be light so that the enemy does not take advantage of our children anymore. The enemy does not take advantage of us anymore. The enemy does not distract us with the issues of life. Because we are soldiers called onto your army. We are soldiers. We are your people. We are your ambassadors. And so, God, we pray that your spirit will hover over this city and you will cause the graveness of this city to turn into gardens in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that from the seats of the government to the corners of this city, to the edges of this city and beyond, Father, your spirit is going to transform this city. We will have your army rise from within the city to speak your word, to encourage children and youth to come back into church, to find you. You will open our hearts with love so that we would, with love, share your gospel. We will see people who are dying in their sins and God, we will run, we will make sure that we do all that we can. We will not just do the barest minimum, but we will do all that we can, that you have given us the capability to do, to bring them into your kingdom, God. You will help us to stay with them so that the fruit that we bear may abide in the name of Jesus. God, we pray for this city. We pray that you will increase the presence of your spirit in this city in the name of Jesus. We pray that your angels will begin active, active, active will begin to become active over this city and would drop men into your kingdom, would speak to the hearts of people, would move people to meet with those who have the answers of Christ in the name of Jesus. Father, we take our children away from the claws of the enemy. Father, we rescue them in the name of Jesus. We declare that they are yours in the name of Jesus. Father, we declare that this city is no longer the devil's. We declare that this territory is yours in the name of Jesus. God, not again will we shy away from our responsibilities, but we will rise up in your spirit and we will move as soldiers. We will declare your kingdom unto every single individual in the name of Jesus. Father, that Sue St. Mary will no longer be called the place where things go to die, but it will be a place where things live again in the name of Jesus. Father, we lift up this city and we declare that no longer shall people come here just because they want to have fun or take a hike, but God, this place will be a place where people will find you in the name of Jesus. They will find you in their experience. They will find you in their lives. They will find you even in the, in the speakings of nature in the name of Jesus Father we declare that this city is yours the environment is yours everything that is resident in this city every single individual people will come into this city and feel your presence people will come into our church and feel you and get your revival in the name of Jesus Father churches will not longer be dormant again in the name of Jesus we pray that your spirit will be made alive afresh and anoint us again so that even from the leaders of the church they will receive your five of fire again in the name of Jesus God we will no longer be just just dormant and just sitting there but God your spirit will make us alive in the name of Jesus our children will stay up they will get off crack they will stop being distracted by every sexual nonsense 
because their joy, the power, their vigor will be of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray healing on every home that is hurting. We pray healing on every emotion that is hurting in the name of Jesus. Father, we declare that this place will be a place of revival. It will be a place of prayer. God, we pray for our pastors. We pray for the leadership of this church that God, you will anoint them afresh again. Father, in the name of Jesus, that this church will burn with your fire. Father, we know that you have been doing a lot of miracles in this church, but God, we want to see more, more and more of you in this place, God. Father, we pray that the wind of your spirit will begin to blow over our lives, over our church. You let the anointing, your, the oil of your anointing to flow upon the leadership of the church so that we will become more effective as they teach us, as they receive word from you. God, we will never remain the same again. In the name of Jesus, God, we declare your lordship over this land we declare your lordship over this this city we declare your lordship over every individual father we will never remain the same again for there is no one that touches heaven that remains the same and god because we have your spirit resident on the inside of us we will not suffer the same things that regular people suffer again in the name of jesus God, we will be transformed. We will be healed. We will be superhumans the way you have empowered us so that we can go into the world healing the people that are depressed, that are oppressed of the enemy. In the name of Jesus, Father, we will have the answers that will lead people to you. We will have the, through our experiences and the things that you will take us through. Father, we will find the, the heart to share the gospel even through our pain because we know that this world is not our home. We know that our ex our reality is heaven so God we declare that today as we have heard your word as we have we determine to rise up in prayer we determine to grow more in your spirit in the name of Jesus we will never ever be the same again because we know that in our time you will raise this place again and we shall have a Sault Ste. Marie that used to be a grave turn into a beautiful garden in the name of Jesus. Oh God. Oh, touch us again, Father. Heal us, God. Let our prayer altars be revived again. Let our desire for the word be refired again. So that we can truly hold your presence in every day, in every day and in every way. So that when people look at us, they can see you. They can say, if I have seen Steve, I don't need to see Jesus. Because I know that Jesus is right in, on the inside of him. Jesus said that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you have seen Steve, you have seen Jesus. Hallelujah. That is what we want our experience to be, God. In the name of Jesus. We know you will do these things even as you have started in our lives. Oh God, we thank you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord a big hand. sing um, the song now graves into gardens and as we sing that song I I encourage you to be in you know open your heart and see God transforming the city into something beautiful that you have never seen before because the Spirit of God the Spirit of God is power and he can change your life just one encounter and he can change this city and it becomes a garden even in this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's sing Graves into Gardens. Never enough, and you. Can 
came along Put me back together Every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you There's nothing Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws But you've seen them all You still call me friend St. Marie into revival. Amen. Father, we just joined together with our brother this morning as he spoke. We pray that the fire of your Holy Spirit would begin to be ignited in each of the hearts and lives of your people as we hear the message. We hear the message that we would speak the word, that we would live the word, that we would, yes, lay aside those things in our lives that distract us from serving you, Lord, that we would be those people that are single-purposed to see your will be done in this city, Father. We just claim it as our brother has already spoken. We agree together, Father, in Jesus' name, that it's your purpose to bring revival to Sault Ste. Marie 
and you're going to begin in the hearts of your people, Father. We praise you this day because we know it's your purpose stated clearly, not your will that any should perish. And so this day we join together with you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A few prayer requests this morning. Sault Ste. Marie, of course. Top of the list, right, Steve? <laughs> Hallelujah. Wonderful. Thank you, brother. Um, but we have each of us, I'm sure if I asked for hands raised, if anybody had a prayer request, nobody's got a prayer request? <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of them. That we just have those prayer requests. We have those things in our life that we want to continue to lift up to the Lord. And I just want to remember Pastor Ben as he's away playing on the rock, as you said. Uh, I'm sure he's playing too. He was fishing anyway, I know that. And Thelma, of course. And Bob and Diane, Bert Thompson, Connie Holmes, uh, Lois Thomas, Sid and Marge, and all of those hands that were raised. So, Father, this morning, you saw those hands, and, and Lord, you know the hearts that are expressed by those hands that are raised. You know the, the requests that are in the hearts of each one. I raise my own hand. Here we are. in our lives. We need you, Father, by your Holy Spirit to do things in the lives and the hearts of these that have been mentioned and those hands that have been raised to do the miraculous, to do beyond what we can imagine, Father. Your word says that you are able to do more than we can ask or imagine. And Lord, I got a good imagination, so I'm sure looking for big things. And so, Father, this morning, we ask for these that we've named and all those hands that were raised. We ask, Father, for testimony. We pray for testimony, Father, to encourage the hearts and lives of your people, that we wouldn't just come back here and say, well, here's another Sunday. No, we'd come back here with a testimony of what God has done in the hearts and lives of his people through this past week, and we would walk in that day by day, and look for it day by day, Father. And we would get up in the morning and say, ah, I wonder what God's got up his sleeve today. Hallelujah. And so we look for you this morning, Father. We look for you as our days go on, they will be powerful days, filled with your spirit, walking in life in Christ Jesus. We praise you in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to close our service. We're so happy that you came to worship with us this morning. We pray for a blessed week, and we're just going to close with the, the last choruses of Graves into Gardens. So you're singing that on your way home or when you're uh, at work or when you're driving or walking that you'll remember that he's made a way. So let's sing as you leave. God bless you.